false teaching, error, heresy, and how God uses them. Introduction Why doesn't God seem to be angry with false preachers? Why doesn't he just remove them all? God says in his word that he is testing us. He wants to see if we will turn to him as our source of life. If we can't find him, do we then turn to something else? It almost seems to me that God is saying, I want you to have the bounty of the life that can only come from me. And sooner or later you will see that anything else you go after is not the life I am offering, but is in fact death. Those things are falsehoods and delusions. There are plenty of other things we can go after, things that are appealing and emotionally entertaining. People like them, especially if they come from those who appear to be anointed and authoritative. God doesn't remove the errors and delusions and stumbling blocks straight away. They are an important part of learning to recognize the other gods we turn to. The Bible says that it is inevitable that we will meet these pseudo-prophets and pseudo-teachers. But these truths seem to be a warning to us personally. It's important not to use pseudo-words ourselves. If we do, we can be a stumbling block to others. I have gradually been learning that anything we speak about God should be words that have come from Him to us. If those words are only something we think because we got them from someone else, then we are bearing false witness to others and to ourselves. I keep asking myself, is this a second-hand idea from the tree of knowledge? Or has it come from God directly from the tree of life? God patiently teaches us how to walk in his ways. And it takes a long time to know how to speak only what he has given. It's just as well that God didn't choose to immediately remove me. Whenever I said things that were a stumbling block in someone else's life. The foundational truth here is that God is asking, Aren't you willing to come to me? You have turned everywhere else, but here I am. I want to see if you will come to me, that you might have life.
false teaching, error, heresy, and how God uses them. What is the basic premise of this presentation? False teachers are a test of our love for God. Will we turn to them? Or will we turn back to God for our very source of life? Genesis 3 Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden saw that the tree of knowledge was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make them wise. They were warned not to partake of it. It was a test. Deuteronomy 13 God is testing you to find out if you love him. Judges 3 The Lord left certain nations, very much like leaving false teachers, to test Israel to find out if they would obey his word to them. Part 1 When we are exposed to false teaching, God is testing and strengthening us. Chapter 1 God is allowing us to be exposed to falsehood and to alluring attractions. These may seem good because they suit our emotional needs at the time. But in fact, they are there to test and develop a love for him. God tests us when we encounter the words of preachers. Deuteronomy 13 if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, even if the sign or the wonder comes true, you are not to listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you Will they turn our attention away from God in any way if we follow them? To find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God watches to see if I choose to listen only to his words. You are to follow the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments. Listen to his voice, serve him and cling to him. Listening to him puts to death this seductive voice. That prophet or that dreamer is put to death. Not literally. For attempting to allure you away from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. 
God leaves us exposed to certain things that we should recognize as wrong. Judges 2 and 3 They didn't cease from their own practices, nor from their stubborn way. So the Lord said, I also no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. It is to test if we go after them or follow only God. In order to test Israel by them, whether they will keep the way of the Lord, to walk in it as their fathers did or not. So the Lord allowed those nations to remain, not driving them out quickly. He did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to test Israel by them. God gives us opportunities to prove that we value him and his word before all else. They were for testing Israel, to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers through Moses. Daniel 11 by smooth words he turns to godlessness, those who act wickedly toward the covenant. But the people who know their God display strength and take action. Those who have insight among the people give understanding to the many. Yet they fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. Troubling times last for a season, but help comes. Now when they fall, they are granted a little help, but many join with them in hypocrisy. Moffat's translation Many join them under false pretenses. Some of those who have insight fall in order to refine and purge them and make them pure until the end of the time because it is still to come at the appointed time. Psalms 119 I rejoice at your word as one who finds great plunder. I hate and despise falsehood but I love your law. Those who love your law have great peace. and nothing causes them to stumble. Factions may not be a bad thing, for they help identify what is genuine. See more detail in part 6. First Corinthians 11 It is necessary that there also be factions among you, 
The word factions in the Greek was hieresis, which is the word for heresy. So that the genuine may be recognised among you. Chapter 2. Our final salvation is the outcome of the trials and proving of our faith. It is not only hardship that God has been exposing us to, but also to all sorts of false teachings and false prophetic words. This process produces many things such as wisdom and endurance. Our faith is proven and tested till we obtain our salvation. 1 Peter 1 You are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various tests, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. See link 1. Hijackers will be tolerated no longer. We have an accuser who serves the purpose of testing us. 1 Peter 5 Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Sometimes it's useful to think of the devil as a personality but sometimes it can be useful to think of this adversary as the figurehead of the fallen nature within each of us. This was how Jesus used the terms Satan and the devil. See Link 2, Jesus used the metaphor the devil and Satan. But resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are working in your brothers who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, 
the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen and establish you. James 1 Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach. Chapter 3 Mankind has always shown a tendency towards idolatry, in the form of false teaching. Is it perhaps that we begin to make things up and that is how wrong doctrines begin to emerge? Is it sometimes because the person doing the teaching has lost their intimacy with God? As if they are no longer receiving fresh manna. And so they have to create something from the mind of man. See link 3, Manner. Mankind tends to love making his own idols in the form of teachings. Jeremiah 5 An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority. Authority means hand, using one's own strength. And my people love it so. But what will you do at the end of it? See more similar scriptures in Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 13. See link 4, Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 13, be wary of false prophets. Habakkuk 2 What prophet is the idol when its maker has carved it? Or what use is some idol that has been created, which is only teaching falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. We admire them, set them up with all sorts of ritual and finery. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake! To a mute stone, Arise! And that is your teacher. 
Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver. But they don't give us life, but rather falsehood. And there is no breath at all inside it. God lives in his temple in our heart, so let them be silenced. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. This tendency to fashion false teachers has always been common in man. Isaiah 3 God is removing both supply and support. The whole supply of bread. One lays hold of another in his father's house, saying, You have a cloak, you are our ruler, and let these ruins be under your charge. Those who guide you lead you astray, and confuse the direction of your path. Jeremiah 10 Mankind is brutish and dull-hearted, devoid of knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by the images he has formed. For what he pours out is lies and falsehood. See Link 5, The Bronze Serpent. We should realise that they are only an empty vapour. with no breath of life. They are an empty, vain vapour. An undertaking which is error and delusion. God exposes us to them, but they do come to an end. In the time of their punishment, they are exterminated. The portion of Jacob is not like these. Jacob is used here as a metaphor, a word picture. One way this can be understood is that Jacob is the new creation in Christ. The new inner man is not exterminated. The old man and its error is. Ephesians 5 but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this is why scripture says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you.
Link one, hijack is tolerated no longer. There was a time, the story could be told, when some hijackers took over a whole plane load of people, using small weapons, and managed to convince all the passengers that they were under their authority. This plane ended up part of a major disaster, causing much devastation and sorrow. The captured people hadn't known what lay ahead, and had simply submitted to this imposed authority. Then later, the people on another plane faced the same thing, and discovered what the hijackers were after, but this time they fought with them. They almost managed to overpower them, but it didn't quite work out, and the plane crashed. The result could have been victorious, but it seemed to end up in a similar disaster. But at last the time comes in our story, when a hijacker tries the same thing again, but gets overpowered by an alert attendant. This attendant receives injuries, but these are only minor, and the plane is saved. From early in life, there is a pattern. There will be many things that are going to benefit us, but there will also be many things that seem acceptable, but they hijack us, resulting in trouble. When this happens, we are uninformed, as to what we could have done. Then comes some level of discovery, about this hijacker being vulnerable. So we struggle with him, although we don't quite get it right. However, in time, we are forewarned, and have learned to be more attentive. And next time it happens, there is no delay, and the hijacker is tackled immediately. With regard to false preachers, the pattern seems to be the same. When faced with some spiritual delusion, which is effectively hijacking our emotions and our spiritual aspirations. We just willingly yield to the authority. We haven't yet learned to develop the determination and emotional maturity that will be required for us to grow any further. Inevitably, at some point, we venture out, and try to break free. Although, this requires some trial and error. Then we can begin to walk in spiritual maturity. Where we are watching and attentive, and no longer gullible. At each further sign of a hijacker attempting to impose man-made authority over us, we are alert, questioning, wanting to test things. Link to the Devil The devil need not be a problem, this is simply the accuser. Now powerless, as we learn to overcome, and endure. When the accuser comes against us, it is often in the form of friends. They speak, and do, what sounds good logic to them, but it is not right for us. For it wasn't birthed from God, 
but rather birthed from the old flesh self. Jesus used the metaphor, the devil, and Satan, directly identifying his close friends. John 6, verse 70 Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is the devil. Wherever the Greek word diabolos is used, it is usually translated as the devil, the accuser. In other places, there is the Greek word diamonian, which is translated as a devil, or a demon. Matthew 16, verse 21 Jesus began to show his disciples that he must be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Jesus described the devil as the father of what is in the heart. John 8 verse 41 You are doing the deeds of your father. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Jesus was tempted by the devil to choose glory and power rather than to die. Matthew 4 verse 8 Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. This picture of the devil is exactly what Jesus must have been struggling with. After all, he was now recognized because of healing the sick and teaching with an anointing. But God was telling him to give it all up. Would he keep all that success in the world? Or serve God as he had been shown? God makes full use of the accuser, but the new creation in Christ remains untouched. Isaiah 54 verse 16 I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I have created the destroyer to ruin. No weapon that is formed against you prospers. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment you condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Paul spoke of the devil in relation to his own flesh. 
2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to repeatedly strike me. Link 3. Manner. Psalm 78, verses 22 to 40. They did not trust in his salvation. Yet, he commanded the clouds above, and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna upon them to eat, and gave them food from heaven. Man did eat the bread of angels. He sent them food in abundance. In spite of all this, they still sinned, and did not believe in his wonderful works. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness, and grieved him in the desert. John 6, verse 31, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread, out of heaven, to eat. Revelation 2, verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give some of the hidden manna to him who overcomes. Exodus 16, verses 9 to 35. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, Come near before the Lord for he has heard your grumblings. It came about, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the sons of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it came about, at evening, that the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, on the surface of the wilderness, there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. When the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, every man, as much as he should eat. You shall take an omer apiece, according to the number of persons each of you has in his tent. The sons of Israel did so, and some gathered much and some little. When they measured it with an omer, he who had gathered much had no excess, and he who had gathered little had no lack. Every man gathered as much as he should eat. Moses said to them, Let no man leave any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. And some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. They gathered it morning by morning. Every man as much as he should eat. But, when the sun grew hot, it would melt. Now on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, then he said to them, This is what the Lord meant, 
Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, and boil what you will boil. And, all that is left over, put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning, as Moses had ordered. And it did not become foul, nor was there any worm in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. It came about on the seventh day, that some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Remain every man in his place, let no man go out of his place, on the seventh day. So the people rested, on the seventh day. The house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed, white. And its taste was like wafers with honey. Then Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let a noma full of it be kept throughout your generations, that they may see the bread that I fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put a noma full of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The sons of Israel ate the manna forty years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. Link 4, Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 13. Be wary of false prophets. Jeremiah 23, verses 9 to 32. As for the prophets, my heart is broken within me. For both prophet and priest are polluted. Even in my house, I have found their wickedness, declares the Lord. From the prophets of Jerusalem, pollution has gone forth into all the land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, The Lord has said, You have peace. And as for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of his own heart, they say, Calamity does not come upon you. But who has stood in the counsel of the Lord, that he should see and hear his word? Who has given heed to his word and listened? I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way, and from the evil of their deeds. I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from each other.
Behold I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues, and declare, the Lord declares. Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them, and led my people astray, by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet, I did not send them or command them, nor do they benefit this people in the slightest, declares the Lord. Ezekiel 13, verses 2 to 23. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy, and say to those who prophesy, from their own inspiration, listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets, who are following their own spirit, and have seen nothing. Israel, your prophets have been like foxes among ruins. They see falsehood and lying divination who are saying, the Lord declares, when the Lord has not sent them, yet they hope for the fulfillment of their word. Did you not see a false vision, and speak a lying divination, when you said, the Lord declares, but it is not I who have spoken. They have no place in the council of my people, nor are they written down in the register of the house of Israel. They have misled my people by saying, Peace, when there is no peace. And when anyone builds a wall, behold they plaster it over with whitewash. So, tell those who plaster it over with whitewash, that it falls. Now you, son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people, who are prophesying from their own inspiration. Because you disheartened the righteous with falsehood, when I did not cause him grief, but have encouraged the wicked not to turn from his wicked way, and preserve his life. Therefore, you no longer see false visions, or practice divination, and I have delivered my people out of your hand. Link 5, The Bronze Serpent What starts out as something from God, can end up false and idolatrous. In this account in scripture, God's people treated God in the things Moses said, with unbelief and disobedience. It wasn't long before poisonous serpents began biting them, so Moses had a bronze symbol of a serpent made. It was put up on a pole for the people to look towards, to save them. Numbers 21, verses 4 to 9 Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea, to go around the land of Adam. And the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt, to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. 
so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, because we have spoken against the Lord, and you. Intercede with the Lord, that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, and set it on a standard. And it comes about, that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he lives. And Moses made a bronze serpent, and set it on the standard. And it came about, that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. This was a type of Christ being hung on the cross. The serpent is hung on the tree. The wickedness and death that is in us was overcome by Christ. When he died on the tree and rose again. John 3 verse 14 as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But, because it was made out of bronze, it was used for worship, until finally Hezekiah had it destroyed because of the idolatry. Second Kings 18 Verses 3 and 4. Hezekiah did right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. The medical symbol, the caduceus, is a similar image. There are many myths about its astrological origins. Applications of the bronze serpent could be if young babes in Christ sit under one man's teaching, and accept this man as their head. At that stage it may not be idolatrous. But in time it is likely that they will begin to gain false understandings. God's design is that anything other than drawing from him will become idolatrous. Any relic, any icon, any ritual, any superstitious dependency. Also, continuing to place too much emphasis on the cross and the passion and death of Jesus, like worshipping the serpent on the pole, may paradoxically prevent us from learning more of God and the work of Christ in our life. This was False Teaching, Error and Heresy and How God Uses Them Part 1